it deals with external uh, fruit yielding or walking in faith. It deals with the Spirit of Christ. And so when, when Brother Todd's talking about the receiving of sonship or might receive sonship, it depends on, again, the way in which God speaks to this. It's speaking about how he, again, imputes to us like he does in the Revelation. The best way to understand that is in the Revelation passage about the book of life and how he's not going to add your name but blot out your name. So think about it that way, meaning once you've been given, as we saw with the, the minas, we saw with the, the, the talents, once you've been imputed something, you're accountable to it. What you do with it is something totally different. But what you're, what you're imputed with, you're accountable to. The difference in the talents, of course, was according to their capacity. But the reality is, still, you're accountable to what God has imputed to you. So therefore, you could have received, the, a, a, you know, you're in a position to receive sonship versus actually ha having, waiting to receive it in reality. Just like in the Book of Life, our names are written in there when you're in a position to be an, an, inher an heir. doesn't mean you're going to stay one because you could erase your name from it, blot it out. That's not funny. So that's a very, like, wow. So it's the same thing with sonship. It has to do with your being in, your, your, you've received sonship because you've been given the mysteries and understanding of the inheritance. You've been in a position to be a son. You've received sonship, meaning you've received your seal of the Holy Spirit, right? Doesn't mean you're going to keep it. You've been given a imputed authority of ownership. I'm um, what you're going to do with that. So you better continue to like the virgin's passage, not be foolish, but be wise. And then you'll actually, you've been imputed sonship, then you'll receive the sonship by continuing to live in accordance with what was imputed to you, likened akin to being in the book of life and not being blotted out, being able to sustain what you've been given to you. Like in the Ariston, you've been given entrance to sustain so you can't inherit. So speaking of that similitude of thought, to your point, yes. In a sense, is the Holy Spirit like the, the sower and the Spirit of Christ, the reaper? I mean, the sower doesn't yeah. just throw the seed on the ground and say, "I'm done." Well, the Holy Spirit, yeah, Holy Spirit is the sower and the cultivator and well, the. That is what a sower yeah, is the yeah. They don't just throw the seed on the ground no. and say, "My job is done." <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, correct. So, the Holy Spirit the, is the sower, the cult, he's the farmer. Uh, who sows the, sows the harvest and, 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 and watches over it, and then the Spirit of Christ, to your point, comes in when the yield of the harvest comes. Yeah, the he comes in. Good until it's reaped and, and Correct. Or, I mean, Correct. Which is why most people don't even, know, don't even know the Spirit of Christ in their life, because they're so busy planting the seed, not watering it, and then wondering, getting mad at God, their crop burned, and he's like, you didn't do anything. And they get they, this whole cycle of their life. They want to obey, then not obey. Believe part of God's word, not all of God's word. Believe in some God in the sky, and read a book, or watch a movie about something about God, and they, and they get all off. They never, they never do, delve into the spirit of, of God's truth and his word to understand the Holy Spirit's work is to renovate them. They don't, they don't get it, to your point. So it's like, if I just, the analogy is like, again, if you just plant a seed, and you just, and that, I, remember a, I remember a real life true story of, of a guy that he's a farmer by trade. His dad planted strawberries and okra and something else. I forget what it was. But he told me, I didn't know this. He told me, I still don't understand the true truism of this, but I trust him if he's, he's the agricultural third generation farmer out in Plant City. And he told me that his daddy got mad. He bought this seed. He told us all go and fail. He thought like this here. Go and fail and plant some of my feet apart. This is how he talks, by the way. He said, so, and I said, okay. I don't understand what you mean. He goes, no, you understand. You got, you got to put seed somebody, you got, you got to go walk so many feet and then dig a hole so many deep and put seed. And he told us how to do it. He showed us how to do it. And we did it with him. And it, it takes a long time to do it the way he told you to. And you get to see, you got to go there and do it. And, and some one brother, he didn't care, man. He just, he just did so many feet and just dropped it. He, dig, he didn't dig a hole at all. Man, daddy was mad. Like, we, I don't, what do you mean? He goes, it didn't grow. You, did, you have to have so much between. You have to have space for it to grow. And I'm like, I didn't realize that. And the, it has to have a certain depth. That, that part made sense, the depth for it to take root. But it has to have so much feet apart, too, for it can grow. I didn't put, as soon as he said it, it made sense. But I didn't put that together at all. So he, he showed me by something I thought was just a given. Like, who wouldn't do that? He, he goes, he goes because it takes longer. That's why. You want to get, it's hot out there, man. You want to get inside. Pay your friends, you know? And I'm like, really? So I remember him telling me that, thinking, wow, I wonder how many folks in Christ do the same thing. They don't want to spend the time where it's, where it's, where it's hard to learn and grow in God's word. They want to do the easy thing. You know, they, they punch a little checkbox on, you know, I, I read the daily bread today, you know. They don't really want to spend time understanding what God says. They go by what the preacher guy says or whatever. They don't want to spend their own home cooking time and find out about God. And so they just kind of haphazardly approach how they sow their seed. 
They just kind of, you know, they, they cast here and there, and they, think, they wonder why later on in life when things get rough and tough, why they don't have enough to draw from to get through it. Well, that's probably why. Because you have no, oh, you go from these experiences, and like I mentioned before to you, people that are of the different supernatural or sensationalism, they, when that's all good and dandy and things are good in your life, as soon as things get challenging and obstacles come up, that just crumbles like a house of cards. It's not good. You get nothing to stand on. There's no leg to stand on because you just, there's no, there's no girth there. There's no substance. So I hope that answers your, kind of what you're saying. It is true. The Holy Spirit is the, the farmer who sows, cultivates, renovates, and continues to keep watch over the field, and it grows to yield and harvest time. The Spirit of Christ comes in and goes, he's like the combine. He's, he's like the, 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 the reaper. He comes in and reaps what, what the Holy Spirit has sown and cultivated to grow. And then they work together at that point onward. But before that, the Holy Spirit's just getting things ready for the Spirit of Christ to come in. And we act like in Christ. He's always with me. No. He's not given by different measure, but the Spirit of Christ doesn't come in your life until the Holy Spirit has done a minimum work in you, and then he comes in your life. Otherwise, he's not in your life at all. Now, Just saying, say, he's not. Not to say the reaper's job is easier than the sower's either. No, no, it's not. They're both, they're, they're both have their challenges. The, back in the James 5, the murmuring and the judgment, it seems to me like Satan started out sinning by murmuring, like those angels that wound up in Tartar. Well, he, he did, and yeah, he did that. And by the way, that's why Jesus even said too, but in the parable of the wheat and the tares, he says that he will come and reap at the end. And he, he separates wheat from chaff, which is the, you don't do that at the beginning, at the end of the harvest you do that. So he's always talking about, to your point, him, he's the end of the harvest. Like he waited to Satan to come to fruition, then he reaped what he sowed in his rebelliousness of arrogance, and also lined up with murmuring. The, the Holy Spirit did his, does his thing in our life, but the Spirit of Christ is about reaping. He is about the separation process. And it just, it's amazing to me how people act like they have the Spirit of Christ in their life, but they don't. If you've not had the Holy Spirit in, in, in dwell you, have his presence in your life, and then rest upon you, then you have no chance of telling me the Spirit of Christ is in your life. Those three have to be true. He has to be indwelt in you. He has to have his presence in your life, again, dwelling in you because you believe in Christ. His presence in your life by you having outward manifestations of anacrino renovation going on, where you have being sanctified and reconciled. I can yeah, anybody can see it and know it in your in your in your personal life and your relationships with God and others. And then and then thirdly, He's resting on you because now you just have this the abiding Spirit is on you, that you are constantly just abiding in God's Word and, and as a striving point. Even though you have your ups and downs, that's your striving point, and the Spirit of Christ then begins to be out of your life at that point. It's a three-step process. It isn't just, I believe in Jesus, the Spirit of Christ is in my life. I'm going to start bearing fruit right away. No, no, no. He, the Holy Spirit indwells, then he has a presence in your life, then he rests on you, then the Spirit of Christ starts to show fruit. That's how it works. And, and what does the Holy Spirit do? We're making it sound easy, but next week we're going to sum up all his works he does to remind you of this summation of this study. He does a lot of work. He's doing a lot of work to prepare the way. Interesting. That sounds familiar. John the Baptist. He is the preparer of the way. The Holy Spirit was encaptured with John the Baptist. He is the preparer of the way, prepare the hearts and minds of people to be, to be penitent, to be understanding that the letter of the law is not at the point. It's the spirit of the law. And Jesus came around with his own spirit. By the way, in Luke 23, what did Jesus say? Father, into your hands I commit the Holy Spirit. No, my spirit. That's what he said. He didn't say the Holy Spirit. He said my spirit. The spirit of Christ. That's what he's talking about. I, I, I didn't write it. That's what he said. So, you can say what you want to say, but that's what it says. Then you go, by the way, just go over, let me show you some things in the book of Mark. Watch the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, in, in, in chapter 2, there's certain places where Jesus can say, um, like in John, he was vexed in, his, he's vexed in the spirit. But in, in, in Mark 2, 8, Jesus immediately perceived uh, when they were saying only God could forgive sins, and, and he says, perceiving in his spirit, in his spirit, that's the spirit of himself. That they reason amongst themselves, he says to them, why did, you, why did you reason thus in your hearts? It was the spirit of himself. So again, you can say, well, it's always the Holy Spirit. It didn't say that. It's the spirit of himself. It's his spirit. So then you go to Mark chapter 8, verse 12. Look again, Mark 8, verse 12. It says it differently. And deeply uh, groaning. I said they're saying how many signs you want. They want different signs. And he said, and groaning deeply in his spirit, he says, why does this generation seek a sign? And again, it's the spirit of himself. That's what it says. Not the Holy Spirit. He didn't say the Spirit. He said the spirit of himself. So he makes it clear that it's not the Holy Spirit. He would have, said, he would have, he would have maybe said spirit or the Holy Spirit. When he says spirit of himself, it's clearly the spirit of Christ. That's him. So I, and this is, this is who taught Paul. 
on the backside of the Arabian Desert. The Spirit of Christ taught Paul. People don't understand that because Christ went to heaven. He said, how can Christ leave heaven? No, he, he didn't. The Spirit of Christ came down and taught Paul. The Spirit of Christ is, is profound because when the power of the Holy Spirit is on you, that's when you know that you have wisdom and understanding being given to you. How do I know that? Because the book of Daniel talks about it being an excellent spirit and excellent wisdom. That's different. It's different. So you have different power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit can, can, can give you a, a different depth. I don't, and he does that through the, the Spirit of Christ, again, being a, a, just a beyond unfathomable teacher to you to give you insight. So the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ together, when they're teaching together, holy moly. The Holy Spirit by himself is beyond comprehension. But he tells you in the book of Corinthians, chapter 2, right, 1 Corinthians, he searches the depths of God. So imagine him working in tandem with the Spirit of Christ, who the Apostle Paul got taught by, and we saw the difference in that, didn't we? When Peter talked about his teaching being off the chart, like way beyond people's comprehension. That's the result. When they're both teaching, ha, 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 you are, that, that's, that's just like unbelievable. It's unreal when they're both teaching at the same time. It's unbelievable. They both do teach at that level of depths of, of mysteries and secrets. But again, we're getting short of time, and I want to go through next week's uh, lesson on, on surmising all of this and getting to a point where we can actually remember the person and work of, of the Holy Spirit. But I want to make sure, I don't, I don't want to miss two things. I, I, I said if I didn't point to you. So I'm going to go to the pledging and to the sealing. I mentioned it, but didn't go to the scriptures. So if you go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 5, I want to make sure we go to these couple verses here. This is where the pledging of the Holy Spirit comes in. 2 Corinthians 5, 5. He says, Now he who has produced us for this same thing is that God who has given to us the pledge of his Spirit. And that is an earnest down payment, right? Then you have, again, uh, that's going back to uh, Galatians 3, 2, when he says, This only I desire to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit of, on, on account of works of law? Or on account, it says of obedience. Nope, it's of hearing. Or of hearing of faith. You see? You receive the Spirit through a hearing of faith, not by works of law, because he was our pledge of an earnest down payment. And Paul's talking to Galatia about living by the Hebrew roots movement type of thing. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's your teacher, not, the man, not man, not law. So then you go over to the sealing of the Holy Spirit, and you go to Ephesians in chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter, that's the pledge of the Holy Spirit given to all who believe in Christ. Verses Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, when he says, By whom also you have heard the word of the truth, the glad tidings of your salvation, by whom I say you have believed we were sealed with the promise, with the spirit of the promise, the Holy Spirit. So again, this is speaking to a promise of the Holy Spirit. And if you look over, now this is where I, this is a good way to end with this idea. We started with this language of what they call declension nouns. So look at this word for salvation. See the TNS before it, even though it ends in AS, satirious. It's not plural. It's singular. Because of that of the. That gives you the idea right there. Whereas later, 113. 113. And then the same thing with in verse Right before that, when he says, uh, you can look up and see where he says uh, the truth, the word before that, same thing. It's, it's the truth's in A-S, but the article before it, of the, is in the N-S. That tells you it's also singular. Same as the word for um, promise, again, is singular. The word for inheritance is singular. But the word pledge is plural. See, the word pledge is plural. That is plural. So you do have the word pledge being plural. So you can see where, again, uh, it's, I, there's two, there's different pledges, right? There's the earnest down payment of the Holy Spirit in our life, again, for all those who believe, but in Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 13, I just lost my page there, sorry about that. When you go back there, he's speaking to a sealing of the Holy Spirit as the promise in verse 14, which is, which is our pledge. You see, it's this pledge plural, you see? You see, plural. Why is it pledge plural? Because everybody has a pledge in Christ. That's, for, that's 2 Corinthians, right, in verse 5-5. Five, five. But in, for, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, there's pledges plural of the inheritance of us in the apolutrosis redemption of the periparesis, right, into the praise of the glory of him. 
So again, even though the words may not be plural, I said that incorrectly, the idea is still that there is a plurality involved here because the word pledge is definitely plural. Thinking of the pledge given to all believers versus another pledge given to those who have earnest down payment for the entrance into the heavenlies of the Ariston, looking forward to the Daiphnon, which is again dealing with the sealing, which the word seal is the idea of a infused, infused authority of ownership versus pledges of earnest down payment. Two different words. And then lastly, I want you to see of these two verses uh, con con contrasted to each other, two coupling of verses, Ephesians 4, 1 to 4. I exhort you, therefore, I, I, the prisoner of the Lord, to walk worthily of the calling which you were called out. Look at the phrase in there, called out. The calling which you were called out with all humility and with patience, sustaining each other in love. So he's talking to mature ones, the called out ones. Then he says in verse 3, using diligence to preserve the unity of the Spirit, that's the Spirit of Christ, in the uniting bond of peace, that is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the bond of peace, whereas the Spirit of Christ is the unity we're supposed to have, being one body, one spirit. He's talking about, again, mature ones. Now watch this. Go to Colossians 3.14. We're going to end with this idea of concept between the Holy Spirit and Spirit of Christ, how they work together in tandem, not separate from each other, but in coordination with each other, which is why they're often confused. Who does what? But if you go into, uh, in verse 14 of Colossians 3, and besides all these things, he's, all these things we know he's talking about, again, how we should be bearing with each other, going through how we should love each other, and, then he, and forgiving. And he says, besides all these things, put on love. It is the bond of the completeness, not the bond of the peace. So the bond of the peace is the Holy Spirit. The bond of the unity is the Spirit of Christ. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because how many people do you know that are in Christ that don't want to believe in the Bible, don't want to live the way they should, how do you have unity with those people? You don't! You know how easy it is to have unity with folks who believe in Christ and want to live for Him? A lot easier. Those who want to, mature ones that is, those who believe in Christ and who want to live at a high level of the called out ones, back in Ephesians 4, 1 to 4, living as a called out one, you want to be subjected to the book, it's a lot easier to live in unity because you've already had the same foundational ground floor. We all agree there's truth within truth. There's a depth of scripture to be, a, to be admonished by, to be subjected to. We can have different variations, but th there's a common ground to come back to, to be sterizo, to established in this truth within truth that the depth of God's word matters. So there's a lot of easeability to have unity in that mindset versus someone who doesn't even believe in God's word or believes some wackadoodle stuff about God's word. That's a lot harder. That's why you're not called to that. You're called to unity for those and the spirit of Christ at a mature level versus having a bond of peace with everybody in Christ. So I'll repeat that again. You have, to, you have to have a bond of peace with everybody in Christ. You have to. But you're supposed to have a unity in spirit with those who are mature ones in Christ who are living in the spirit of Christ. Then he says in, in Colossians 3.14, above all these things, put on love for if you, if, by showing the bond of complete meaning when the bond of the Holy Spirit's in your life, the bond of peace, and the bond of the, of the unity of the Spirit of Christ in your life, then it leads you in love to have the bond of completeness. Because then it's full maturity or full fruition of completeness. Look in verse 15 of Colossians 3. And let the peace of the anointed, see? Because you have his peace now. Preside in your hearts for which you were also called, again, called out in one body and be thankful. And he talks about being the Word of God dwelling richly, in you, dwelling richly richly in you, teaching and admonishing. So again, he's talking about how the spirit of unity, spirit of Christ, the bond of peace, the Holy Spirit, come together to work together to bring the bond of the completeness through love. And that's what he's talking They work together, not, not separate from. They're not separate from. They're, so to surmise, can you have the bond of completeness if you're in Christ and never go on sanctification? No. 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 Can you have the bond of, the, can you have the spirit of unity if you're dwelling, if the Holy Spirit indwells you and you have his presence in your life because you're working on sanctification and reconciliation, can you have the spirit of unity in your life? No. That's the spirit of Christ. That comes after that. So, and even at that, that's for mature ones. That's way after that. So again, you have to understand what he's saying and why he's saying it and the audience he's speaking to 
he's calling out different levels of peoples to different levels of understandings of how altogether there is some commonality, but there's some distinctions too in who we are in Christ. Yes? Okay. Yes, correct. And, and just, uh, just now, maturity. maturity. That's right. And the completeness is a teleotis. It's a variation of that word to reference the maturity, the fullness of the completion, which is speaking to mature ones, because that's who Colossians is written to. We know that from doing our study before in Colossians. So just like Ephesians, written to mature ones. What a coincidence. Talking about a sealing of the Holy Spirit. So again, um, we're going to go through this on next Sunday as well. We covered a lot of information. We'll go through the summation, the takeaways of the personal work of the Holy Spirit. We'll sum that up, and then we'll go into our next study. After that, we'll be on prayer, just so you know. We'll talk about prayer, and that'll be our next study. But we have one more study to go. It'll be the recap and summary of the personal work of the Holy Spirit and how that parlates into the Spirit of Christ. So we'll see that next week, and we'll, we'll summarize that. So let's close and pray. So Father, we thank you for this time we had together today with you. Thank you for your love, your peace, your understanding, your continual guidance in our lives. Help us and, and, and inspire us to always be cognizant of your presence and of your Holy Spirit and of you, the Spirit of Christ, working together in conjunction to bring us not just in the bond of peace through your Holy Spirit, Father, to all those in Christ, but also more particularly the bond of the Spirit of unity for those mature ones, like, like-minded, so that we together can have the bond of completeness, a full maturity in your eyes to grow deeply and richly in and with you and showing that by our love. So thank you, Father, for all that you have done, continue to do in our lives. We thank you and are grateful to you for who you are and yet you are to be revealed to us. Help us be pleasing to you as your children and as your servants. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.